Hello everybody, my name is Rob Lindsay. I am head of programs for The Space. I'm a white male in my early 40s, sat in my familiar box room office in a slightly crumpled white shirt on this hot day. Uh, as I say, I work for The Space, who are a digital agency and a commissioning organization set up originally by the Arts Council in England and the BBC in 2014 in order to support the arts and cultural sector. We have commissioned more than 300 digital projects over four years with online and broadcast audience reach exceeding 30 million sessions and over 800 organisations accessing our support in one way or another. Uh, lovely to see more of you introducing yourselves in the chat as well. That's wonderful. And do look out for Angela, my colleague, who is popping information to captioning for today if you need it. A huge thanks to Jen who is providing our captioning for us here today. I'll talk through the structure of today then. I think we've got everyone here in terms of what we're going to be doing. So the introductions and how we work, you can see that's where we are now, that's myself. Uh, and then in a moment we're going to hear from uh, the, the first of our case studies. We've got Jan Williams who has joined us here from the Caravan Gallery. She'll be followed by Robert Howell from Culturalpedia at which case, uh, at which point, sorry, we're going to have a break at 11.45. We will have a screen break so that everyone can go and look at something more than two feet away from themselves and grab a cup of tea or coffee if you need to. And then we'll come back after the break uh, and hear from Sajida Carr from Creative Black Country. Um, there is going to be space after each speaker for questions that you may have. And again, thank you to those of you who have submitted questions in advance. Um, but there will also be time right at the end of the entire session for group discussion. Any additional questions that you might have that you want to put to all of the speakers uh, or any thoughts that you might have, again, please do make use of the chat. Um, if it's useful as well, you can pop a question in the chat and it may be that we do uh, come to you in order to, to, to um, add some further thoughts if we need to, so do feel free to use that. Uh, and then right at the end, we're going to wrap up, as I say, at 12.30. Um, so I think without further ado, um, we'll get started with the first of our speakers. So we're going to hear from uh, Jan Williams, who has joined us here from the Caravan Gallery. The Caravan Gallery, for those of you who don't know, uh, believe brilliantly in doing things with people rather than at them. Uh, using photography to celebrate overlooked and occasionally bizarre aspects of everyday life. The caravan is also a mobile exhibition space. It is a genuine physical caravan that engages with people and places that uh, normal, in inverted commas, galleries might not easily reach. Um, currently working in Openshaw, Manchester, where they join us from today, and also Tile Hill Coventry as part of the Coventry Libraries Digital Spaces project. Um, Jan, if I could ask you just to turn on your camera, join us here today, and if I could ask you just to give us a brief description of yourself and introduce yourself, anything I might have missed from that bio. Hello, lovely to be here. I seem to have a strange background in this meeting room of some cherry trees, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Anyway, I'm, um, I'm small with a rather tatty denim shirt, uh, some Poundland reading glasses today, um, cropped hair. And uh, I have a very small yellow caravan that's a lot bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's, uh, that's downstairs. We're currently, as you say, working in uh, Manchester settlement in Manchester. So the caravan is unusually sited and we have our own encampment at the back of this amazing community building, Manchester settlement. So um, I'm, there's a teaching English class going on in the room next door. So I'm expecting people to burst in any minute. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, for those who aren't familiar with the work of the Caravan Gallery, um, would you be able to tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, so um, basically uh, the Caravan started out in the year 2000. It was, we have a studio in uh, Arts Base Portsmouth. And uh, there was a call out for a socially engaged project to go into the community one. It was for the bank holiday weekend in the millennium, August bank holiday. So uh, we won the commission, Chris and I, we went in search of um, a mobile exhibition space that would be good to take our artwork to where people are down the seafront. 
I was making a lot of work at the time in collage, photography, drawing, whatever, about um, leisure, landscape and lifestyle, about everyday life. So it seemed like a perfect, literally a vehicle to display that work. And so uh, we, we made an exhibition in this caravan we ended up with that came from Hailing Island. We gutted it out. We kept the original floral brown upholstery. Um, but the rest of it became like a white cube. And it was really important to us to make it look kind of, it was kind of quite cute and accessible on the outside. But once you got in, you could really, you could understand that, you know, we're kind of proper committed artists. Um, there's a lot of humor in our work because we find that's a really good way to kind of cut through and deal with some really quite, you know, a lot deeper things. But basically, that was a really fantastic weekend. We were absolutely mobbed by people. And um, it was just joyous, that interaction with people. Now, at that time, a lot of our work was just about uh, my partner, Chris and I, Mr. Caravan Gallery. It was about showing our own work. But people's response to what we showed, showed there's a real thirst for people to join in. They were saying, you know, there's a lot of the, the photographs um, brought about lots of conversations and questions and we were thinking how do we capture this how do we use this so since that time when you think that weekend it was meant to be a one-off bank holiday weekend in the year 2000 what year is it now we're still going so <laughs> something right um Fantastic. so we, we just kind of forged our own path really because we we just kind of we, our, our approach is let's just try things and see if they work and um, we're very flexible and adaptable we kind of fit into any situation any space and um, we love the way that with the caravan it can one minute you know it can be on a seafront and the next minute it can be outside a betting shop in Norris Green in Liverpool another time it can cheekily make its way into documenter in Castle so it's this kind of mixture of high and low in the things, in the stuff we do and the things we photograph and the things we kind of feel everything connects and all the projects we do, it's about connecting people and things and subject matter and acknowledging difference, but looking at points of connection. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I know that as you as you say, you can fit into lots of different spaces. You do tour all around the country as well. It it must feel that you're constantly building new communities, and at the same time, maybe having to to start from scratch each time, go in and, and meet new people, introduce yourselves to new people, mm -hmm. and let's not forget existing physical communities. You know, you're in locations, and there are communities there as well. Can I just ask what that involves, really, and and yeah, what what those communities are like. A lot of groundwork. Oh, I'll just show you a picture of the caravan. This was one of our favourite projects that we did. It was called Aberdeenshire Ways. And um, this, that was um, a, one of our, again, our, we've done so many commissions where we've made like lifelong friends and brilliant connections. And, you know, we sustain those relationships with the people we meet. Uh, Aberdeenshire Ways was with Deveron Projects in Huntley in Aberdeenshire. And we really loved their ethos because at the time we worked with them, they didn't have a physical space. They just said the town is the venue. And so all artists who work there, they leave a piece of work behind that becomes part of the town collection. So it can be in the butchers, the bakers, the garage. Um, we had a, an exhibition on a bus shelter and a washing line gallery in the square on a marketplace. Um, so, with a project like that, I mean, that was such, it had such a strong sense of identity. Some of the older people spoke Doric, which is a language we didn't even know existed. Um, I think we're, we're in a really privileged position with the Caravan Gallery because we're, even though we're commissioned by people, we're free agents, we're not the council. We, we are asked to work for and with organisations, but we're artists and we're kind of conduits, I think. Um, and we have found a way of bringing people together who would never normally have any kind of social interaction because their paths, their lives are just so very different. And I think the, the gimmick actually of having a yellow caravan 
you know, people just can't resist going, what is it, what's in there? So our perfect scenario is having someone who's gone to take the dog for a walk or, you know, buy a loaf. Oh, I've had a little freeze. I don't know. Is that at my end? Can someone give me an indication or a nod? Ah, there we go. Okay. Thank you, everybody in the chat. I genuinely wasn't sure if that was just me and you could all hear Jen or if it happened across. Um, okay, we'll take a moment just to let Jen come back. Um, but do check out the links that are in the chat um, that, that illustrate what the work is as well. Um, I spoke to Jen earlier in the week. Oh, hi, Jen. Jan, sorry. Oh, I'm back. I don't know where I went. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. It was only for a moment. It was absolutely only for a moment. You were talking there about the the irresistibility of having that yellow caravan and people yeah. just wanted to be coming and check it out, which actually leads me quite nicely onto the next talking point because I'm very interested if there's ever any, uh, and, and this touches on what we talked about the other day, if there's ever any cynicism for the public, how do you actually explain your work to them? And I suppose to chat a little bit about the language that you use to, dis to, to describe it to people as well. I think the most cynicism we hear is about a lot of the places we work in tend to be places that are economically not very well off. So there's a lot of cynicism from people about stuff like regeneration and them and they and the council. Um, but they, and we do these surveys, they're not like boring surveys, they're just, quite off the walls some of the time, but it's genuinely asking people what they think. And they can come in and have a moan. Some, some people just come in to complain about parking or dog muff or whatever, um, council usually. Um, I think we try to show quite a balanced view of places. Some people in, will look at our photos and go, oh, why have you photographed that? You know, there's a fat cottage down the road. And we <laughs> say we're just kind of, when we go to a place, we'll scour every square inch, we'll walk around, drive around, photograph, and just kind of get a feel for what we observe. And that's a starting point for conversations. So um, the subject matter that comes up, people might be quite cynical about, you know, oh yeah, that you know what that's for, and uh, oh, that's never going to work. But I think we are just utterly and completely honest and open with people. It's difficult if you get someone in maybe who has really racist views or you get you know, some readers coming in the caravan and we have to be really careful not to shove our views down other people's necks because I think it's our role to listen but we wouldn't you know we would challenge toxic views of course we would or we find maybe the best thing is to gently say oh do you think so or we wouldn't wouldn't agree um I think people see when, when we talk to them in really plain language, no jargon, just saying, well, you know, we photographed that because we wondered what it was. Can you tell us? It's a portal. It's a way into a conversation. And I think it's up to people to make their own judgments about things. But we're just trying to bring about, trying to make people look and see and respond. Yeah, yeah. I really love the idea that you've got this, you've got this fantastic bright yellow caravan that can just rock up in someone's town or village or, you know, wherever it is. And, and it was that simple, there's bollards. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Additions, <laughs> health and safety. <laughs> but you've got something there that is, that is, I, I would say, quite an iconic physical item that can appear. In yeah, yeah. But at the same time, and, and that is very much you guys but at the same time the art that's at the center of all of this is there is ownership to the communities that you're moving into you know and particularly those conversations that take place afterwards as well i know that I'll, and I'll share this with the group a little behind the scenes secret when you and i were setting up a call even to have a, a sort of chat through about your work there's some preparation ahead of this webinar and you did have to say we are open so at any moment people could turn up people might come in you know and you're there to have the dogs there's always dogs coming in <laughs> <laughs> and, and just for that that kind of that openness and that presence I think and I think it's something that I think is is very important with communities you've talked about footfall being a huge driving force as well 
I wonder if I could ask you to talk a little bit more about that. Really. Yeah, it's because, so the caravan is just, it's become increasingly our calling card. At one time it was, you know, the main focus of what we did was in the caravan. And so, for example, when we, one of our favourite jobs ever in the Black Country, the Black uh, Blast Festival with Multi-Story. Mm -hmm. So that was a major, major project, which resulted in a six-week exhibition in a former Poundland in West Bromwich. So we took over the whole place and there were a couple of other amazing photographers that had a smaller part of the building. But basically, we, we think of our kind of co-created exhibitions as evolving explorations of place with the people of the place. And so we, we have a basic framework. We have a kind of formula that we adapt to where we are. And it's just great because you just don't know what's going to happen next and who's going to walk in through that door. So we kind of think of them like alternative tourist information centres, but made by the people. So we would start off with some of our photos just to get the ball rolling. So, you know, when people go in, they can look and talk. Uh, we, we make these great big maps. That's one of our favourite things, a big hand-drawn map that we ask people to annotate with then. Um, Oh, ghost sightings often appear on them. It could be where people found a tenor, really obscure things about mystical rain. And, and then, you know, some people put really sensible, kind of serious, studious facts and information on there. And other people just want to make their mark to show that they exist, really. And where they fell in the canal in the cuts was a big thing in the black country. What was so absolutely brilliant was the conversations people had in front of this map because it was a really massive one. And there'd be people writing something on and then the person next to them would say, did you used to go, you went to school there too? And then they'd have a conversation and find out they were cousins or something. Yes. And, um, and then it's just kind of never quite knowing. You have to, it's absolutely exhausting because in an area with high footfall where we always try to do these projects, you know, there's just constant activity and you're having to manage like, you know, someone homeless who's come in who might be a little bit drunken in front of kids that are in and then someone with mobility issues who needs support with so, oh, just a whole lot of, you have to really spread yourself all over the place. And ideally you have a really good team of volunteers, helpers, and um, importantly, local ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Quite often we find someone who's come along to kind of look at the project or be part of it, gets so involved that they just want to, they never want it to stop. <laughs> And they just stay there and they become self-appointed volunteers. And that's brilliant because, you know, if you have local people on side, um, that really helps with the kind of trust thing. It's yeah. not just people coming in from the outside and then sodding off again, you know, it's <laughs> kind of properly, properly embedded. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, I would say if anyone has any questions or anything you'd like to ask, do pop it in the chat. As I say, we've got a couple more minutes with Jan and then um, you will be staying on the call and, and we'll have some more time for some group discussion towards the end. But there were a couple of questions that people sent in, in advance and there were two in particular that jumped out that I wanted to put to you if it's all right, Jan. I'm going to join these together because I think they might be part of the same part of the same approach. It's about sort of getting started with community activity. So someone had said, as a small organisation with very limited man hours, we're interested in how you successfully isolate what the local community requires and then deliver it um, without falling into a sort of tokenism of community engagement in inverted commas that may happen with all good intentions. So that idea of identifying what is it that your community needs? How do you go about doing that? And how do you go about delivering it? And then someone had asked a related question about asking about the kind of activities you can run to start engaging in community. So again, that 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 kind of beginning approach, first ideas for reaching out and establishing what your community needs. Can I ask you a bit about that? Because you do that every single time you arrive in a new city. We do. Well, I think it's really important to the best, you get the best results and the best preparation, like doing a recce, you've got to get to know the place. So we would usually go and have a week just roaming around, going to just talking to people. We'd go around with our cameras, photographing stuff. Um, 
so that would be the very first thing we and just try and fix up a few meetings go to community organizations go to libraries go to pubs just go to where people are and so really try and get a feel for the place and then very often the, the organizational gallery museum library whatever who's commissioned us we have conversation they would usually have some kind of priority like you know we're struggling to reach this community so we would come up with strategies with the caravan for example we can take it you know people go on about oh no go communities or no you don't want to go there so we said okay right let's go there then <laughs> but we try i think if if you make friends with caretakers cleaners uh road sweepers um i'm not going to say traffic warden uh, <laughs> I suppose we should do really, but just, just kind of be, just be friendly, talk to people, uh, spend time in the place, and it, you know, it, you just have to really put yourself out there. And then there's different phases. Maybe we get back to the studio, and then there's all this massive stuff, like huge loads of photos, conversations, things to absorb. And then I suppose it's about building connections with some of those people, following up. Um, taking an interest in, you know, we might go along to uh, like meetings about allotments or community gardens, or there's an awful lot to do, obviously, with poverty, food poverty. So we might go along to food pantries. We found working in Tile Hill that the church is a massive part of the community and they provide a lot of services along with the library that, you know, you might expect council or social services to do and another thing is isolation is a massive issue we come across people just want somewhere to come and hang out so i know i'm deviating slightly here but i just think it's a really important thing to say in society today we come across so many people struggling with their mental health and i think just creating a place a place an environment where people can just come and be and be listened to and to share you know, to be heard really because a lot of people just feel overlooked and no one cares about what they think so if we can celebrate things that they do we we, we always have a creative area like with you know paper collage stuff uh, we do creative walks we just arrange programs of stuff depending on where we are so people can just join in and very often they go oh no you wouldn't you know i can't do anything and we say well just come and have a cup of tea just come and hang out and then before they know it they're doing something and um yeah that's a really important aspect of it just kind of we can go in and identify very often what's missing in a community by what people tell us we yeah. know what they want that isn't there so quite often we can present that back to whoever we're working with to say you know people really want somewhere like this permanently yes yes and that must be incredibly creatively nourishing as well i'm sure going out and having those conversations it must be generating more ideas or more oh. you know more inspiration than you could ever possibly deliver on so it must that's be another important point i wanted to say as well you know the idea of not this parachuting in business we're very yeah. very careful that we I mean it's inevitable that you know if you go in from outside you will have different things to add um but it's just kind of sorry I've lost my train there what was it about you were talking about parachuting in um rather oh than... yeah that that's it so it's about selling it's really important it's crucial to see what's already there because we see in lots of places organizations in a place don't connect with each other. They're all being busy doing things. Them over there, them over there, they don't talk to each other. Um, so we like to find out the good things or what's already happening and highlight it, just kind of, you know, give it some kind of platform. So if there's someone been beavering away in their shed making something, but no one's seen it, if there's an art project that happened a couple of years ago and it didn't really get much coverage, um, if there's people need, you know, quite often we introduce people to each other that we've met in our projects, say, oh, you want to get together with them, they, they know how to do that. So it's just, it's about connecting in a massive way yeah. and, and, and celebrating what's already there and helping to build it. 
and maybe trying to initiate and support people who as a result maybe of our projects want to start something then we can kind of mentor them yeah that's amazing that's amazing thank you so much Jan well look there was a couple of things there as well that I think would be really interesting in the group discussion as well so there's a couple of things I'm going to park there but that was wonderful I'd say thank you so much for for yeah. sharing your insight and your experiences um it was brilliant and yeah I can see colleagues have popped links to your work in the chat as well so I would encourage everyone to check yeah. that out um and we'll uh we'll we'll um see you later on this morning if that's okay magic thank you very much Chan. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much, Risha, who's just popped that link in the chat as well. Please do check out the work of the Caravan Gallery. It really is fantastic. All right, we'll move on to our second speaker, uh, who I'm sure will have some thoughts on what we've just heard, and I know that their work very much builds upon a lot of what we've heard about there. Uh, we're going to hear from Robert Howell at Culturepedia, uh, who create culture for and with the people of Lancashire. And uh, as they say, their mission is to give ideas legs, which I love. Their spot on programme works with communities to tour performances and stories all across Lancashire and rural Northwest England. And it includes digital series, which started in lockdown and have grown and evolved ever since then. Robert, hi, thank you for joining us. Could I ask you just to give us a, a brief description of yourself and then tell us a bit more about the work of Culturepedia, please? Will do. Hi, Rob. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Rob. I'm a middle aged bloke, white bloke with fairish hair, a dark blue jumper, big round glasses, um, with a, uh, a white wall behind me when you can see half a picture by David Hockney, not an original. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the work of Culturepedia? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're, we're based in Lancashire um, and that's where we work and that's where we uh, all, all our all our engagement happens. Uh, Lancashire is a big place, population of almost one and a half million. So, you know, we're just a, a small brick in that wall. Um, we, what we focus on is effectively community curated content, um, and which is mainly professional performing or visual arts, but curated by um, the people of Lancashire or our sort of non-geographic community of artists. Um, we work with artists from all over the world. Um, so that would include things like we run the rural touring scheme for Lancashire. So we take professional performing arts to village halls and community spaces in rural areas. That's called Spot on Lancashire. That's been going for, well, that had its 25th birthday in the middle of lockdown. So we weren't able to celebrate it, really. So but the moment's passed now. We'll have to wait for the 30th. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also do um, a similar programme in libraries in Lancashire, where we put professional performing arts into libraries. Um, we do we run a, 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 a literary festival called the Burnley Words Festival. Well, it's going to, going to be called the Burnley Words Festival in Burnley. Um, we're doing other work with other projects like markets in um, Baker, Haslingdon, Blackburn, Darwin, um, and various activities around the place. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, I think it's really notable that in the work that you do, you've got almost two communities. You've got your audience community and you've got your community of artists as well. Mm. Um, mm. And you mentioned a moment ago, you just said, you know, your 25th year anniversary. Um, can I ask you a bit about that, that length of time, about, about how long you've been working with these communities? Because I think sometimes the time it takes to build a community, I think yes. sometimes gets forgotten, it feels like. I, I, absolutely, 100%. I think that, yeah, um, we are very much embedded here in Lancashire and have been working with a lot of communities for a long time, but it's amazing how many people still come up and I've never heard of you. And what are you doing? I mean, Lancashire is a big place, yeah. and what we what we tend to do is working in those micro communities. So unless you're part of one of those micro communities, chances are you won't have come across us. Um, I think our ethos very much, and this relates to what you talk the, the question for Jen as well, is that we push at open doors. Mm -hmm. So. Um, whereas, you know, a, a good geographical spread of our work is really important, 
we don't try and contrive relationships with communities. So um, a good example of this is the library service who in Lancashire are fantastic and we've been working with for about nine years really closely in terms of putting professional performing arts into libraries. We started off by, you know, saying which librarians want to play, who wants to, who, who is keen on being involved in this and engaging in this, rather than someone on high sort of looking at a map and thinking, oh no, strategically we need something there. Yeah. So it, it's very much about ownership and it's really important that those people have ownership. But like I say, it's about pushing it open doors and it does take a long time and it takes a lot of conversation and a lot of cake. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. But yeah, I really love that idea of, uh, and again, um, similar to what Jan was saying earlier on, that idea of, of occasionally you may go in and go, oh, you should work with those people, you know, networks already exist, people are already out there, communities already exist, and it, I think it is very, very important that when we talk about building a community, that often will overlap with existing communities, and we do need to be yeah. respectful of those. We do need to to listen to those as well. It feels like yeah, um, yeah, and and use those connections and those links sometimes. Yeah. So, um, and and I think that's yeah, that that's great when you can sort of uh, step into a sort of ready-made group. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I'm aware then that you've got these different overlapping audiences because you yeah. will have your audience of art, uh, your community of artists, you'll have your community of, of, of audiences, they, they're probably a Venn diagram, there are probably artists from the audience for other artists work. Yeah. Um, I think when we talk about uh, digital communities as well, that's probably another yeah. circle, not Absolutely. everyone will be in that and it will also include some that aren't necessarily seen as part of the other groups as well. Yeah. But you yeah. Know, if I ask a little bit about, you've talked there about operating over a very wide area. Can I ask you a little bit about the digital divide in your area and how that impacts upon any kind of digital community work that you've done? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, we, we've, we've been learning a lot about that digital divide and, and about digital poverty here in Lancashire. And, and when I say digital poverty, I don't necessarily mean financial poverty. Um, it is amazing how, um, I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm in Blackburn, you know, with a population of over 100,000. So it's a big town, you know, but the mobile phone signals in Blackburn are pants um, because they've just not been invested in. And there's an awful lot of rural Lancashire where, you know, if you're lucky enough to have broadband, it's, it's surviving on a rather worn out hamster and a rubber band. So there's, there's no way you can access you know, video content without it buffering every three seconds. Um, and and that, that is a real issue here for a lot of Lancashire. I mean, and there is there is also the other type of digital poverty of people not having the, the money to have the devices or um, not having the devices in, enough devices in the home and things like that. Um, uh, and, and in addition to that, there's a lot of people who've just not got there yet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm, mm, um, mm. Do you mind if I ask you as well a little bit about um, kind of what you know about audiences? I know that when you and I were chatting the other day, we were talking about community building often comes from, mm. what was, the, you, you had a fantastic quote about rural touring being the part that happens yeah, it's the it's 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 the art that happens either side of the interval. That was it. That was it. Yes. And yeah, and that that idea of community building very much being about it's not just about the art. That gap isn't just there to give everyone a breather and change the sets around. That is part of the experience and and yeah. so forth. Very, yeah. very 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 much so. I mean, what we do. I mean, I can't take credit for that quote. It's from Francois Matarasso, if anybody's interested. Um, okay. But the 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 what we do is we take the artist to the audience and I think I mean just as a slight aside I think that one of the reasons we do that is that in somewhere like Lancashire I mean Lancashire you know leveling up is a big big agenda at the moment and from the Arts Council's point of view Lancashire almost entirely needs leveling up apart from the the big 
um, affluent Ribble Valley, which has mainly got sheep. Um, the, uh, and, and so we take the artists to the people because they're not in the habit of accessing professional arts. But the difference is that the artists are visiting those communities. So they go to a village or they go to a library in a small town and the audience will know each other. I mean, if we were all up to go to a, um, a big theatre in a big city now, wonderful as that would be, it would almost feel like we were visiting the artist. Mm -hmm. um, and we probably wouldn't know many other people in the audience. Um, whereas in the context that we're doing, the audience all know each other. So that social interaction is really important. Um, and it is a, it's an excuse for social interaction. And if they get to see some great art along the way, then that's, then that's fabulous. But that, that, that benefit of that community and building social capital is, is, is vital in what we're doing. I mean, that's a lot more challenging with digital audiences because they're not meeting. That, yeah. That's and, exactly and, what I was going to ask. Yeah, your experience of, yeah. you know, if all you have is data, you know, kind of... Yeah. And, 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 and that's a really, one of the things that we've really learned as well through doing the digital stuff is just how much we value that sort of grey observational data and how to us that's much more important than what the audience agency would have us collecting. So, um, you know, seeing, seeing an audience and seeing the smiles on their faces and getting that, hearing those sort of throwaway comments, um, seeing the whites of their eyes, seeing their tears if they've been crying, that doesn't come across in a questionnaire. And it certainly doesn't come across in the same way in comments on social media. Um, and we really miss that with the digital. And I don't, I mean, I have no idea how you could even start to get that. But, you know, we, we don't, I mean, we were talking before, I mean, with, with social media, you've got these great, sorry, with, with digital work, you've got things like YouTube or Facebook as a sort of almost like gatekeepers between us and the audience, you know, and we put it out on their platform and they send it off to the people and then they tell us, you know, 342 people watch this for more than 10 seconds or whatever it happens to be. <laughs> and, and that really doesn't tell us very much um, because People don't, I mean, I, I do the same. I, I watch things online and I think, oh, that was great, that was fantastic, but I don't always feed back. Yes, yes. It's yeah. interesting as well, I think, for any of us here who ever took part in any kind of online forums or message boards or things like that as well, you often saw that you might have a, a message board that was being followed by 600 people and it was the same sort of 12 to 15 of them that were doing most of the comments. You know, it was that kind of idea. They, those sorts of things do often skew one way or another yes i think it's also worth acknowledging they are again you talk about the kind of the the the, the gray data that you get in these conversations yeah. with people being in places and it is important i think to realize that a community is made up of probably you know 50 or 60 different types of interaction probably more probably you know hundreds yeah. thousands of different yeah. types of interaction as well and it's yeah. difficult to try and kind of measure that you know there are limitations on what we do and we have to work within those limitations in order to find what we can you know we do we do yeah. we do absolutely and so you know it's not saying it, in some ways it means that the digital putting the digital stuff it's still worth doing because we still know lots of people are accessing it and we still know that some of those are people who we encounter for other work we're doing and some are completely new to us and it might we might get crossover and things like that, and it's still worth doing, but it's much harder to, to, to continually develop what we're putting out based on audience reaction because we're not getting that audience reaction in the same sort of way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so the programming is much harder when you're sort of just sort of throwing it into the dark, really. Yeah. And there are people that will respond to different things. I know a lot of organisations who have said, we've tried doing this one type of activity and it works in some ways, but there are limitations in others or others who have said, we've been using this social platform and we've seen this, you know, our audience are, again, we talked about Venn diagrams before, overlapping circles, overlapping communities. Mm -hmm. Our audience are not made up of, our communities are not made up of 100 people who all behave the same way and want to communicate 
with us and access our art in the same way you know those communities are made up of different sides in exactly the same way that you know a, a family meeting up at, at christmas time or a birthday party or something like that think about them some of them will be communicating on text or on whatsapp or on instagram or on the phone or on email or you know whatever it might happen to be we're a we're a complex mix of yeah. people yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so uh, and yeah it, it, but, it's very complex I was going to say that sort of leads on to um, we had a question in advance sent through, which mm. I wonder if I could put to you as well, um, which was uh, someone had said um, it, it was a little bit about about kind of use of digital use of Zoom, which yeah. I know you and I have talked about before as mm. well. Someone had said, you know, is there a way in which you can create engaging and interactive experiences despite the limitations? Of Zoom or video conferencing software, and and I think this also probably touches upon that topic of Zoom fatigue that you and I have talked. Can I ask yeah, you I, th on that, please? I think it does. I think there's a, a couple of thoughts on this. One is, don't focus on the limitations of Zoom. Focus on the the potential of it. Um, just I talked about us working in libraries. Um, I mean, in terms of putting professional performing arts into libraries, we could say, oh gosh, there's an awful lot of challenges here. Look, there's not going to be blackout. Um, uh, it's not necessarily open in the evening. Um, and, and you can start looking at it so that, you know, the space isn't very good and the books get in the way. But then you can, then, but if you look at it from the other side and think, well, actually, yeah, okay, it's not a theater. It's not got velvet seats and a bar but that's fine. What are the other things that are great about it? Well, uh, uh, you know, a library is the most democratic space you can imagine. Um, it's got a transient community are coming through all day, a little like, like Jen, you've got that, that um, uh, sorry, Jan, you've got that, that thing, you know, that sort of ongoing relationship. You've got, so looking at the positives as opposed to the negatives. And I think that, I think Zoom offers so many I mean, there's what, 65 people here now. If if we were doing this in a meeting room in Birmingham, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't all be there. And and because there's people from all over the place. There's things that Zoom allows us to do that um, we cannot do in person. For example, you can sit there quietly and listen and not be seen by everyone. You can contribute on the chat, you can, the, so actually, so taking those advantages of the digital, um, I think it's quite fashionable to say, oh, I'm fed up of Zoom and isn't it awful? But I think we've learned how to use it and we've had accelerated learning by the, by the pandemic. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's true. If, if any of us had three years ago tried to introduce our audiences or our communities to video conferencing like this, a lot of people just wouldn't have gone with it. But one thing that has happened with the pandemic is everyone is familiar with these programs. They are new terrain that we can now use. So, yeah, that's a great point. Um, well, look, what I'm gonna suggest we do is take a break there. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I really appreciate that. Again, some really good talking points to the end. I also just want to acknowledge, I saw there's a question from Applause Rural Touring. Uh, thank you very much for that question. I'm, I'm going to bring that in at the end because I'd really like to bring Sajida into that as well from Creative Black Country. So um, what we'll do is we'll take a screen break here. Um, we will be back in, we'll take five minutes. I'm going to turn off my camera and microphone at this end. We'll come back in five minutes, which according to my computer will be 11.53. I'll turn back on my camera and microphone and that will be the signal to restart. So everyone grab a break, a blink, look out the window, grab a cup of tea and we'll see you back in a moment. All right. Thank you, everyone.
There we go, everybody. So we're just about ready to start again for the second half. We'll start slowly. So if you are running back from a kettle, please don't spill, please don't scold. Uh, a huge thank you to those who we've already heard from in the first half. We've heard from Jan Williams from uh, the Caravan Gallery, who spoke fantastically about working with communities and specifically the importance of going in listening, seeing which communities already exist, uh, working with them, working alongside them as well. We also heard from Robert Howell from Culturepedia, who's talked too about that importance of the soft stuff, the, uh, the, the bits that happen in between the art as well. Um, again, about listening and taking that time to build that community and very much focusing on the positives, which I saw from the chat, which Jan agreed with as well, that importance of looking at the tools that are available to us and not focusing on what they can't do compared to a live or physical or analog experience, but really do focus on the opportunities that they give us. And at the same time, being aware that all of these are tools and approaches to be used alongside one another as well. They are all part of a wonderful, rich mix of interactions that we have with these communities that we work with. Um, well, look, without further ado, uh, we will keep on going and we will meet our third speaker, who is Sajida Carr, who is joining us from Creative Black Country. Creative Black Country's mission is making the most of the Black Country through arts, culture and creativity, uh, working with communities in Dudley, Sandwell, Walsall and Wolverhampton in particular to explore and develop new creative projects with local people in the places where they live. Their current work includes the Offsite 9 program and Dudley Creates, and we'll pop links to some of that work in the chat so that you can check it out. Um, Sajida, huge thanks for joining us. If I could pass the mic to you just to give us a brief description of yourself and to tell us a little bit more about the work of Creative Black Country. Great, thank you. Thank you, really, really good to be here. Uh, so like, uh, thank you for the introduction, Rob. I'm Sajida. Um, one of the directors of Creative Black, Creative Black Country. I am, you can't really tell, but I'm five foot one, got dark hair, I'm wearing glasses, and the sun is just coming out as well where I am working from home. And I've got a blurred background as well. So that's me. Excellent, thank you. And can you tell us a little bit more about the work of Creative Black Country? I've obviously given the little potted bio, but it would be great to hear it from you. Sure, thank you. Um, a lot of what's already been said, it kind of links to Creative Black Country as well, but I will share what are kind of um, what we're about. We're an action research programme and we are part of one of Arts Council's uh, Creative People and Places programmes. And I know I have spotted a colleague uh, from the Creative People and Places programme. I can see somebody's already here as well, so it's great. Um, so we work in an area that's, um, that's in the West Midlands, uh, which has a population of nearly just over a million of people, and it's over four local authorities as well. And we're a small um, uh, team of people that are supported by some wonderful uh, family of freelancers. And for those of you not familiar with the Black Country, the, the word, the phrase, the Black Country comes from the soot, from the heavy industries that covered the area at the time, which is most um, the most industrialised parts of the UK. Our accountable body, who we report to, is a, is a partnership made up of seven uh, really wonderful organisations. There are four voluntary councils that cover those four local authorities and uh, three national portfolio organisations as well. And we are really, really fortunate that they are there to help guide us. They act as an advisory group, but they also have the expertise and the links and have access to nearly like 4,000 uh, community groups as well. So they're a corridor to audiences for us. Um, but we as a program, um, you know, we are an action research program, but we have been acting as a catalyst, a broker, an enabler and a facilitator and developing a program work that's relevant to our local residents, which reflects the local makeup of our communities as well. And you know, that 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 mission that we have is many things to many people. And at the start of the programme, we were getting a lot of um, kind of inquiries about 
you know, what do we do? And because of that reason, actually, Francois uh, Matarasso, who, who was mentioned before, he came and helped us with kind of trying to pin down what we are. And yet, at that time, still, we are seen as many things, but we work with partners in a way to explain what we are because we want to be something that maximizes the cultural and um, creative um, sector in, in the Black country. Um, so we really see about amplifying what's already there and at um, the heart of everything that we do is people and our approach is about having a place-based approach um, with local people at the heart of the process. And these words co-design, um, co-producing, they're all, I mean these are words that are said now but we are actually <laughs> standing on the shoulder of giants. This work has been done for decades so really very um, proud to be kind of carrying the, the mantra of the work that's been done before like, like um, like Francois. Um, so, but when you boil it down, the work that the, the way that we work, it comes down to community making decisions, shared leadership, and just constantly learning, reflecting, and kind of um, acting upon what's actually needed in the areas or what's more helpful as well. That's absolutely amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And yeah, very much echoing this approach we've heard from all three speakers today, the, the importance of, of listening, of seeing what's needed. I love that list of the list of words you did a list of about four words there that were like enablers and brokers and connect all that sort of stuff. I think it's really, really important to, to recognize language like that because it again echoes that we're not looking to go in and say, hello, we're in a town with no communities whatsoever. We're here to build the very first one. You know, it, it's absolutely not that. It is absolutely building upon existing networks, existing relationships, which, which I think is absolutely amazing. Yeah, amazing stuff. Um, do you mind if I ask you a little bit about the um, Creative People and Places program for a little bit more on that as well? Because I know you've been doing a lot of work in that area. And I know it's a program that um, Creative Black Country are very good at, at trying to build that community as well, making sure that people know about what's available. Can I ask you to say a bit about sure. it? Sure. Um, for I mean, yeah, there are 33 programs across um, up, uh, across the, the, the country. Um, and that community decision making, the shared leadership, those are all things that kind of common threads. And this is a program that's funded by Arts Council. And there is an expectation around making sure as a consortia driving um, the work as well, but people remain at the heart of it as well. So that when you go and visit different places, a CPP one, everyone's got the same um, sort of ethos, but everyone's delivered it in a different way. So there's no blueprint for this work in a way. Um, but um, as I mentioned, there are it's there are certain threads that carry through, but it is a program that's funded by Arts Council to kind of build on, you know, the strategies that are coming through, the let's create work that's going on as well. So it's building on all of that. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Um, well, I suppose uh, let's let's talk about communities. And again, let's let's keep talking about the, the work that's involved, really. I know that when you and I spoke prior to this webinar, that was one of the things that came up, kind of what do you need in place to work successfully with communities? And I know you were quite quick to say, it's about attitude, perhaps more than resource. Yeah, um, I've been thinking about this question and it took me back to when we first started, you know, um, you know, we'd, we'd just been awarded this um, funding by Arts Council, we needed to kind of get going, um, increase our visibility and and I will be um, honest about the fact that, you know, we 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 quickly got some work going, but actually looking back now, um, and reflecting on that, what we've actually got to do is already what we've heard is we've got to stay flexible and be with people where they're at rather than kind of bringing some work in and um, having a, a one shot, um, you know, a one hit wonder and walking away. I think it's really about starting with people and spending the time. And we've spent after we've done the kind of, you know, making the bringing work in and we just thought, you know what, let's just take our time. Spent a few years, the first few years, understanding what the landscape's like. Um, and uh, working with our creative uh, advisors who are placed, who are placed in each of the areas and really listening to what's around us. And that's how we got to know the joy and the gem that is Odessa pubs. Um, we wouldn't have known that had we not spent the time to kind of see what, what is special about the black country. So, um, and that kind of made us go, you know, in places where there isn't a lot of money, we've actually really got to create relevant programs and be quite sensitive as well. So look at how we scale our programming as well, whether it's quite intimate or quite or large scale as well. So it's just kind of being a bit aware 
about the sensitivities um, of the area. And it's, it kind of alludes to what Jan and Robert were also saying as well. Um, it's talking to people and finding out what's, what's important as well. Um, and it's also taking our time as well. Um, because again, at the start, I was just thinking that we were, you know, we had these kind of processes in place, but we were at, at one point taking um, too long to make decisions because we were quite cautious as well. But over time, we've kind of reduced some processes and looked at how do we make it simpler that we can um, uh, enable communities to access the resources much quicker. So having the letters of agreement, making the payment schedules really quick and easy or, you know, putting processes in place, it just really helps people come back to us. And one of the things that I do want to flag up is, is around the data collection and monitoring. And we have, you know, this is core part of our, our work. We have to, um, you know, it's, it's related to our funding agreement. Um, and, you know, we've tried lots and lots of ways of getting all the information together and everything, but only in the last few years has it, has it we've become more successful in getting those numbers and understanding what people uh, um, have felt about our work and the impact. And it's that it's the point when the agreements are made, the phone is picked up to the person and say, um, how, uh, do you have any other questions? And do you understand why we, um, how important this data collection is? And it's that rapport and relationship. And at this point, we are so pleased with how um, the members of the team have been able to reach and get a lot of data back as well. So it's about, I mean, yeah, we've got to do it, but actually it's a relationship and rapport building that's been, been amazing as well and getting the data back as well. And kind of having, um, whenever we do, like you mentioned, the offsite nine work, we'll have pre-chats as well in place as well to say, um, come and meet the other successful applicants. Um, and we even do the pre ones as well. I mean, that's great. We kind of do a QA, and a a bit like what you guys do as well, like come and understand what the strand of work is, but it's just constantly having a touch point with people to have a connection and see how people are getting on as well. So I think that's um, that's really, really important. I think, you know, um, reading the letters of agreement and actually do, do actually anyone really read it? I think it's when you pick up the phone or you speak to somebody face to face. I think that's when it really comes to life. That's amazing. That's amazing. I really like, it's almost like the idea of um, finding out what obstacles there are between these networks, these potential collaborators, these communities, and then just doing what you can to remove it. And it may be that that is simply creating a space or providing an introduction or something like that, which I really, really like. I like as well what you're saying here as well about, um, we talked earlier on about standing on the shoulders of giants. And I think it is really, really important to recognize as well that the more of this work that you do, you will be standing on the shoulders of your own previous projects. You know, the, the work that you've been doing, you're talking there about, establishing ways in which over time you're able to streamline processes again i'm assuming that you're building trust in these communities with every project that you do can i ask you to talk a little bit about trust and if it's not too difficult also a little bit about relevance because that keeps coming up as a kind of hot topic as well with the communities that we work with yeah um so trust we we found that it comes with time and um going out and having that uh, cake and spending time with people and sticking to our word as well it's like if we said something we're going to do something then we stick to it as well but i think it also helps that we have um you know our consortia partners as our, our advocates as well and the more you kind of work with partners they become your cheerleaders in a way so um that's how you kind of build a trust and i think that's what's been the strength of our work it's like we um we we always really want to share the gems of what we've um, done in in partnership but actually it's that's the work that we want to talk about because we're the enabler and facilitator. So our job will be done. You know, I hopefully will. We, you know, we won't need to exist because the work's been done. But I know that will take a long, long time. But the trust comes with um, um, with time. Yeah, I do remember that very first meeting that we had as well. It's like, what you're doing here and why you why you here? We put in the bit. You know, but yes. we just took our time to have those conversations and um, and. Yeah, and the relevance is is by working. I mean, how we found for us as a program is having. I mentioned the creative advisors a moment ago. They are um, they're local. Um, they're black country based, and they're our ear to the ground as well. So that's when we kind of 
get a sense of every team meeting that we have, we meet every week, and kind of get a sense of what's happening, what are the trends that are emerging as well. So that's, uh, and also our MPOs as well, that's how we find out, it's just kind of being visible and attending other events. And, um, you know, we, we work in quite a multi-layered way as well. So we've got the strategic partners, we've got the grassroots communities. I think we're quite fortunate that we really into the cross-sector partnerships as well. So the more that we work in this way, the more we can become relevant. I mean, we, we've started to grow our, um, our visibility with, with businesses as well. I mean, that's took about six, seven years to kind of really embed ourselves as well. So I think it's, it's um, yeah, trust and time to kind of build relevance. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. I think as well, it's worth touching upon, and I'm sure this will be the case for a lot of attendees. I think someone asked about, in fact, I know someone asked about this specifically in advance as well. I think for a lot of people that maybe have started doing more and more work with their digital communities because of lockdown, because of the restrictions of COVID, because we weren't able to meet in physical spaces. Um, I think a lot of people are now fearful that as we can now move into those physical spaces again, their digital platforms, their, their digital communities will become less relevant. Um, I've obviously got my own thoughts on that, but I wondered if I could ask you for your thoughts on that too, because I know digital work and digital communities is it, it's something that you've been doing far before you were doing that far before lockdown you know that's not that's not been a lockdown responsive piece of work for you can I just ask you for your thoughts on that in terms of just to expand on what you've already said but specifically um with regard to to fears around lockdown having been the driver of relevance if that makes sense yeah, so this is about the um, the work around digital um, and working with communities. So I think um, what what's kind of coming through. I mean, this was. Um, could you rephrase the question, Rob? Of course, I can. I beg your pardon. So yeah, it's 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 uh, for people who are fearful that for people who have created digital spaces and built digital communities because of lockdown, who are now worried that actually now that lockdown has eased now that people are getting back to very much in inverted commas back to normal mm. people saying well actually what relevance do these digital spaces have it sort of echoes a little bit of of what robert was saying earlier on as well about people who have maybe seen these digital spaces as yeah. as replacements for live and have always yeah. compared them to live rather than looking at what they themselves can offer and yeah. i know that a lot of your digital communities your even even work that you've been doing on social media Mm. far preceded lockdown you know it hasn't been as responsive to that and you've said yeah. huge think, engagement with audiences not just because they couldn't meet in physical spaces does that make yeah. sense i think it's kind of having um a, this almost um uh, thinking like two in a, in a hybrid approach in a way so um that some of the digital work that that's been going on um and this i think it's been really really amazing to kind of we've opened up to new audiences because it's a, a, unearthed and unlocked some folks um kind of accessing your work but on the other hand as well we know that on the flip side there are people who can only access our work through um analog you know through phone or face to face as well so really really mindful of that and you know who I know we're thinking that things are starting to settle down, but we don't. We still don't know what's around the corner. So, kind of having kind of a two um, a two pronged approach is is probably going to be the way. And and some of the examples that when uh, when we were in lockdown, um, you know, we've already touched on digital fatigue. People were um, signing up and not turning up. Or, you know, you just kind of think from the community groups aspect who've had this commission. They put all this time and effort into it, but actually it's only the audience member having a click of a finger to decide whether they're going to turn up or not. It actually kind of puts it, it, it you, you kind of think, well, people may not understand how, what the value of that time has been, you know, bringing facilitators in and putting all that prep time in as well. But it's just, I think we should definitely see this as a, as a massive opportunity. I mean, we, you know, you guys supported us with them. Um, Hundred masters at a year a few years ago, yes. and that is that was like a two again a two pronged approach. We did these wonderful videos with the support space, but then also we did some physical um, activities as well around that. So the fact that you know one of those videos got nine million views, I think it was quite it was a simple story. So it's kind of staying relevant to what people want to see and hear as well. Yeah, completely, completely wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Well, look, what I'm going to suggest we do is, um, uh, Sidhu, if you can uh, stay on the line and we'll bring Jan and Robert back in as well, because I think there's a, a, a few questions that it would be great to put to all three of you to hear your thoughts, if that's OK. We've had some great questions in the chat. Do keep adding them in. I'm also just going to pop a link to Creative Black Countries Desi Pubs project, which Sadida referenced before, and which is absolutely glorious. So do check that out if you get the chance. Um, and then, yeah, if it's all right, I've got a, a few questions which I'd like to put to all three of you, if that's OK. Um, we had one uh, that came up in the chat um, earlier on. Apologies, I've, I've forgotten to ask this, but it was a really interesting point. Have you found any useful ways of encouraging crossover from digital to real world audiences and vice versa? Um, does it feel like there's crossover in those audiences? Do they feel like they're two separate tribes or where have they overlapped or, or what have you seen? I wondered if any of the three of you had any thoughts on that. It might not be something you've observed. Maybe that's been a challenge, I don't know. I think it's the million dollar question. I think if we made <laughs> that, we could um, patent it and uh, yeah. Um, Mm. I think it does happen because it's, but again, it's about relationship building um, and comes back to everything else we're talking mm. about. So if you, and, and it tend, you know, there isn't a magic formula, it's about conversations. It's, it's about engaging with the people who engage with us, the digital audiences who, gain, who engage with us. It's much easier to get our, actual audiences who we know when we have on a database to access our digital content because yeah we can mention it in our newsletters and in our brochures and in our print and at events you know you've enjoyed this go and have a look at that too and they do people who've encountered us for the first time online it's very difficult to engage in a conversation with them unless they initiate the conversation yes yes and it feels almost like those, like you've just mentioned there, social media compared to your database, it feels almost like there is maybe a, a, a you know, a trail of stepping stones where the relationship maybe becomes richer or deeper as you go. So it might be that we have spaces like I mentioned old fashioned message boards before, which tended to be a place for uh, audiences to talk to one another, you know, whereas you might have your email list and that's the way for you to keep your audience informed on a regular basis and, and build that relationship. Social media is possibly somewhere in between the two as well. And again, we talked about there being different ways in which these communities are made up of individuals and they have shared interests and there will be shared activities and things like that. But, but what are the ways in which are you allowing them the freedom and the flexibility to engage with you and to engage with the rest of that community in a way that feels comfortable to them. I think just, I mean, our focus is on Lancashire, our digital content as, you know, it doesn't matter where you are because the, the, the stuff that the, the project we did with the space and that is ongoing, our shorts, you know, we, we use Facebook and YouTube. Yes. You can see that wherever you are, you know, so if you're, I don't know, watching one of our videos in Sao Paulo, you're very unlikely to rock up at a library in Lancashire, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely. There's maybe an inter interesting question as well, and I've, I've seen a few. I know the Welcome Collection um, uh, made a, a quite a strong statement about this four or five years ago. Um, and, and again, I'm, I'm very glad to see that the, 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 the wording of this um, the wording of this question I think seems to reflect the same thing this idea that our while a real world audience obviously are, are conceivably a ticket buying audience or a donating audience or whatever it might happen to be um, they are both still audiences you know I'm sure that many of us would consider ourselves to be um, audiences of organizations like um, well I mean if we would say the Museum of Modern Art over in the States or even NASA or someone like that you know we're, we're uh, audiences for the work that they do even if we don't physically go to those spaces digital is the way in which we engage with them and I know that Welcome Collection about four or five years ago did do quite a, a strongly or a firmly uh, a confidently worded blog post where they said you know we're no longer looking at digital as being a funnel in which we try and convert people into uh, what we previously considered to be sort of genuine audiences. Um, it, it was saying, actually, you know, if you engage with our collection online in this way, you are part of our audience, you are part of our community as well. And I think that can be quite interesting as well. People will cross over, you know, exactly as Robert said, there will be people that are far outside of Lancashire who can't 
physically engage in that way or Jan I'm sure you've got people where you've done community working places and then uh, the caravan has physically moved to a different location and so people have started people who'd met you in person have started following you on Facebook or social media or signed up to something you talked a bit about long-term relationships oh you're muted I beg your pardon sorry <laughs> No, I mean, we always prefer real life interactions, but, you know, social media is absolutely brilliant. And what Robert was saying before about uh, Zoom and just with everything embracing the positives. For, we did a project in Lytham St Anne's in Lancashire some years ago, and we get a God bless message from someone we met there virtually every night since 2012. And, um, you know, we've become... Yeah, it's a really brilliant way to stay in touch with people. We've just tried out a new thing. We've often made uh, printed books, like publications to um, document projects. It's a really laborious process, a really nice thing to do. But it, it has a kind of finite, it has an end to it, like the book's finished. But we've just tried something new. And uh, with fr our friends at ID Projects, we work with a lot. We've just made a website for uh, the Wombwell Pride of Place project. So that's something we did with Barnsley Museums, just had an exhibition at the Cooper Gallery. And so we've made a website that can continue the life of the project beyond the physical project. So that's it's live now, but it hasn't been officially launched. So um, we're really excited about that because that's that's the way that the project can stay relevant and it can continue. So that could be a way forward for us. That's fantastic. That's really fantastic. It's interesting as well, Ed, and this sort of builds upon another question which we've had. Um, it's that idea of building upon things, allowing things to continue to evolve, allowing things to change. Again, assessing what's working and what's not working. And someone has asked a question in the chat is exactly that, saying, you know, have there been projects when you've learned from things that that didn't go as you hoped they would or didn't go as you expected they would? You know, have there been anything where you've said, actually, we tried this approach, it didn't really work? Because I do, I think that's a really value, valuable part of any case study. And it's often the bit that doesn't get included in the case study. Is that's kind of, it, Rob. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm not a fan of the people that say, we spotted this problem we came up with a solution nailed it the end you know kind of what are the what are the side roads you went along have there been things that you've tried with communities or things that you've learned and been able to adapt from and evolve oh, yeah. and work yeah. um i'm i'm happy to share an example of, of that um so uh, we've got um, a strand called creative communities which is about encouraging everyday creativity and the way that it'd been set up it would be um, through phases you try something uh, that's almost uh, having a go and then kind of developing it but um, what we put in place was some sort of application process that you had to apply and it was almost like a small competition and um, and we, we we carried that through and realized that whilst we're in it we're upsetting people by putting this process in place yeah. So, um, and, I, and when we went, and we just thought, you know, we can't do this again. I mean, we, we did, it was like a similar to a fundraising application process. We just thought, no. And so now what we've done, we've got a much more open process. So, um, and this is linked to the creative advisor helping a group as part of creative communities. But now what we've done is the creative advisor will work in lots of different ways, not just in a concentrated with a group. They're now act as a mentor, as a producer, um, or helping them, uh, you know, look for facilitators or even becoming a human Google machine as well. So it's just kind of having a much more flexible approach to coming up with creative projects. So, um, yeah, I'm glad we put that that kind of fixed approach um, it, it aside and gone for the much more flexible and open. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Does anyone else have anything they want to share? I've got an example. Ah, um, I think flexibility is vitally important. Just always expect something not to go as planned because that's how it would be. And it might be better than what you thought, what you intended. We do a lot of work in empty shops and there's been at least two occasions right at the last minute uh, when we've printed all the publicity, when um, someone found us best off. So we had to change the venue at the last second and total nightmare in Sunderland. But then, you know, you, so you've got to have a plan B, C, D, expect things to go wrong. Uh, the project we're doing now, we're kind of three quarters of the way through and open shore. Um, the problem with that, we couldn't find an empty shop 
in a place with high footfall. So we've got this encampment at the back of this amazing community centre. Um, but the people who commissioned this one, Manchester, they've just had a massive restructuring. And um, we have only just realised that the comms team had all lost their jobs or left. So the press release hadn't gone out, all of this stuff. So, um, but, you know, we found other brilliant the people who are working with us are absolutely great and we're just having to devise activities to bring people in because there's no kind of footfall which we'd usually usually get somewhere in the busiest possible place but it's working but it's just different we have to kind of go out try new activities it's still really meaningful there might be fewer people but you just have to keep devising new methods I think yeah yeah it's interesting that's come up as a kind of theme a couple of times and I think it's worth just recognizing that is uh, all three of you have talked to in terms of the language you've been using it's been notable that you are talking about flexibility you are talking about connectivity there is a kind of um, relinquishing of control which I think is quite easy uh, interesting in the arts because I think you know if someone is a theatre maker they say right the show is going to start at 7 30 you're going to turn up be in your seats the interval will be at this time you know you can grab a drink from the bar or whatever it might happen to be but there is a level of you'll turn up when I say and have the experience I say and if you're chatting so an usher will point a torch in your face and tell you to shush and you know all this sort of stuff whereas everything we're describing here is very much about making tools and mechanisms for people spaces for people but not really exactly as you're saying Jan not planning things out or, well planning things out but not setting things in stone so that there is that flexibility to adapt and to change. Right? And wonderful. So if you just do, if you have that attitude, then it just you're rewarded with wonderful surprises. Yes. Yeah. We have people with owls turning up. Um, <laughs> oh, just random things. We usually get someone with an owl. Most projects we've done, there's been an owl connection or an Elvis connection. That's we haven't had an Elvis impersonator yet here. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> but it's still a week. Yeah, if we have any Elvis impersonators close to the Manchester area listening in, then do get We saw a Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash impersonator the other night, but not convincing. But. <laughs> That's, amazing. That's amazing. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Um, the, uh, a couple of extra things I wanted to talk about. Um, the, the very final one was about the importance of ambassadors, because I know that's been touched upon. And I, I think that's hugely important, that idea of making sure that we're not going in and imagining we're the only person or we're the first person to try and set up a community here and kind of being respectful. I wonder if anyone would, would, would be able to talk a little bit to that, the importance of ambassadors and maybe work that you've done that's, that's made use of one before. I think that's the core of what we do and the, 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 the librarians that pick a show for their community and their library, they are the ambassadors and they have ownership of it. We can't have ownership of it. We don't know, we don't know Mary at number 42 who might need a knock on the door and, and that sort of thing, working across you know, a large county like Lancashire. And, um, and it's the same with our rural promoters. They're the people that know the community and they know what the community will want. And so they're the, we're, we're the facilitators for those ambassadors and those, I don't like the term community leaders, but it was in a sense, those, those people who are the, the sort of the, 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 our main conduit in those communities. That's, that's absolutely 100% the core of what we do. It's really important. Fantastic. Fantastic. They want people to come along and then love what you're doing so much that they want to come back with their family and their friends and their neighbours and someone it will just go out and we, oh in um, Bradford we had um, uh, just it, it was the mascot of the football club there so he we, we came in one day dressed in then um, this like fairy costume and he just um, went out giving out flyers for us and he just kind of hung out every day in our project space. I mean, he was just epic. We ended up giving him a camera because he got really into taking photos and he just, and we had someone called Keith Dagger in Preston. We made badges of him because he was such a legend and there's a double page spread in our Preston book. 
and it was still in contact he comes and says in different projects we're doing and he's just he's just incredible he's a powerhouse of energy he's a character of the big c um but he That's just came in and one day we gave we gave him a lanyard because he was hinting he really wanted one and then he's just <laughs> kind of inviting the mayor in and giving a guided tour and we just stood back and thought yeah look he's uh -huh. get on with it yeah it brilliant just, just picking up on um, the, the community leaders bit, I think it's important that we find the right ambassadors as well, because there are some, you kind of feel like, well, they just want to hold on, but they haven't got that open-minded approach as well. So, because uh, it happens, we all know that it happens, and it's just kind of finding the, you know, the, the local gems who who people won't even hit, heard about. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Very important. One, one last thing that you know saying about the things that went wrong very very rarely but now and again we've had experience of partners who haven't had the same welcoming approach to working with people in communities so we've had partner like exhibitions we've sent people along and said oh go and have a look and then they come back so they didn't even look up and say hello and this was like proper galleries I mean it's very unusual these days but there has been that happen and you just think it's uh, a lot of people that we might, that we encountered, never been to an exhibition before. They say to us, oh, do you have to watch, you have to wear to go to the gallery? So it's so important for, and as I say, it's really unusual now because galleries do tend to be a lot more accessible. But that, that's been a thing in the past that has caused us some concern. And we've had to go along and say, look, could you please just say hello and make put people at ease? Just tell them what's happening. That's amazing. So, That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, look, we're um we're getting close to the end of our time. So um, a huge thanks to everyone for sharing your thoughts. That's been really, really appreciated. Incredibly valuable, very enjoyable as well. Um, I'm gonna uh, just say to everyone who's attending here, we're gonna just pop a survey in the chat just before we finish formally. Um, please do take a moment to fill to fill that in. It is really appreciated. It's how we um, measure the engagement with these um, resources that we put out. It really is what enables us to keep putting on webinars like this. So please take a moment just to fill that in. That's just going to take a couple of minutes. And while you do that, I'm going to ask all three of our speakers, um, if I could ask you just to pop in the chat or tell us where can people find you uh, if they want to hear more from you. We've even had one person, Jan, who has said, if you have ever taken part in any podcasts, they would love to listen to those as well to hear more about your stories. I don't know if you've ever done it. There is clearly an audience out there for it. <laughs> so they do I'm sure I must have done something. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to Google myself. But yeah, just we don't know what day it is half the time, you know, since uh, COVID, <laughs> all our projects stopped, then everything came back at once. So we're thinking of being Coventry, Manchester, Barrow. Yeah. Is it know. an owl, owl day or an Elvis day? Or a job <laughs> Hopefully both. <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, yeah, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for no, having me. No problem at all. And yeah, are you, um, is there anywhere that we can, where's the best place to, to find your work? I think the... Well, have a look on our website. So I'll put the address in. Well, it's www.thecaravangallery.co.uk. That is fantastic. I think... Great to meet everybody that. else too. Really enjoyed the other speakers. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, do um, check out, in fact, do check out the, the event page on the Space website, which presumably everyone used in order to come along here today. That's got links to all the projects that we've talked about here today, um, including the work that Robert and Shajida have talked about as well. Um, as I say, please do take a moment to fill out that survey. It's really, really appreciated. It's really, really useful to us. Do check out the Space website for details of subsequent webinars and events that we'll be putting on as well. And huge thanks to everyone that asked questions both in advance and in the chat as well. That's been a really fun and engaging discussion and I hope it's been really useful to you all. Uh, all right, thank you very much. We'll, we'll leave this open for the moment because I know there's been lots of links and information popped in the chat. So do make a note of that, do grab that information. Thank you, Robert, for popping details in as well of your work too. Um, yeah, do take a moment to grab that information from the chat. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for your kind words as well. That's really wonderful. All right. As I say, we'll leave this open for the next minute or so. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, and speakers, if you're able just to stay on for a moment or two as well, that would be really appreciated. Thank you very much again to everyone. Uh, recordings of today 
will be on the Spaces YouTube channel as well. We'll just get those subtitles up. And a huge thanks again for all of you joining.